We have a really special guest here with us today, and I am so excited to say that this is our first Native Filmmaker Initiative Film Club of the season, starting off here in October. My name is Julia Sherman. I'm the Education Director for the Big Sky Film Institute, and I'm really excited here today to welcome you for this film club, for our first film club film, The Water Walker. Just for those of you that aren't familiar or new to the program, our film club's a virtual youth education outreach program that takes indigenous made documentaries into classrooms across Montana and across the country. And it's a part of a larger initiative, our Native Filmmaker Initiative, that aims to bring more indigenous stories to the festival, support and engage our indigenous media arts community and have a greater impact on community youth like you out there in all corners of the state. Just before I get started, I wanted to make a quick land acknowledgement that I am here coming from you guys, to you guys from Missoula, Montana, and the city of Missoula sits on Salish land, and Montana itself is home to 12 tribal nations and seven Indian reservations with their own culture, language, identity, and history. We encourage schools that are joining us today to introduce themselves in the chat, say what school you're coming from, and if you'd like to make a land acknowledgement, um, we encourage that as well. We'll be providing time and space for you guys to ask your questions either in the chat or if you wanna unmute yourself so we can see your lovely faces, um, that would be lovely and we can answer them in person here. Um, this is recorded. We will be editing out anyone's faces or voices if they like, I'll be following up after the case, but we want other schools across the state to be able to use this and take advantage of it because it's a really special opportunity. Oh, well, I'm so excited for today, clearly. Um, most of you have already seen the film, The Water Walker, but as we get started, I just wanted to introduce Autumn Peltier, who's the Chief Water Commissioner for the Anishinaabe Nation and the film subject of the film, The Water Walker, as well as a young activist and leader in her community. We also have Stevie Salas, who is a writer, the writer and producer of The Water Walker, and is also a co-founder of Seeing Red, Nation, Seeing Red Six Nations, which helped produce and make this film possible. I also have the Montana Office of Public Instructions, Michael Jetty joining us today as well. And we'll be tying in some of these themes and topics into some Montana specific connections so that you guys can talk a little bit about your experience and understanding of what we mean when we say water walker, why water rights are so important. And some of these key historical and contemporary factors that have really exacerbated the issues surrounding water rights, which I'm sure Autumn can clue us in and talk a little bit about her work there. So I just wanted to start off with a question for Autumn, and then I'll open it up for student questions here. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what what made you decide this has been a long journey for you, you're fairly young, and I'm sure you get this question a lot, but what made you decide to embark on this journey as a young activist and as a water rights commissioner and kind of what has that experience been like for you? Well, this is kind of work I already like started doing even before I started doing the work because I was always raised in a traditional lifestyle because my mother is, she's very um, connected to her grassroots as an indigenous woman. And my auntie Josephine was, um, she was already doing the work that I'm doing now before me. And so I was already kind of aware of these types of issues and with indigenous people in Canada and like the importance of water on like a more indigenous perspective and cultural level. And one day, what was like kind of like the pushing point for me was I was at a water ceremony in a First Nations community and I was eight years old at the time. And I ended up having to use the washroom. Of course, I go to the washroom and all over the walls, there's signs that, that read, um, boil water advisory, not for consumption and do not drink the water or wash your hands with the water. And at the time, I have no idea what a boil water advisory is. Um, my, my, like my idea of drinking water is everywhere. And this um, obviously raised questions for me. I asked my mom, like, why can't we, why can't we drink the water? Why, or why can't I wash my hands with the water here? And what's a boil water advisory? And that's when she explained to me what all this meant and that this community, this specific community has been on a boil water advisory for over 20 years. And I don't know why it was, it, it kind of had like an effect on me in a way. I don't know why it was like, I was thinking so big at eight years old, but my thought at the time was that 
looking around and seeing all like the little kids that were my age and younger running around not, like not even knowing like what their community is going through or the fact that they don't they don't even know what it's like to drink water from their tap they live off bottled water and I guess that was like my pushing point where I was like well I need to just speak up and use my voice and I want to make a change and so that's kind of where I started a big journey and it's a big push and I'm sure our students out there were pretty inspired by it. I'd love to just kind of open it up for any initial student questions before I punt some questions Stevie or Mike's way. Students out there um, feel free to unmute yourself and come up to the camera. Does anybody have any initial questions or thoughts or reactions to the film um, now that we have Autumn here? Um, and be, familiarize yourself with her work and how did you kind of start building that relationship? I guess that's two questions, but kind of what inspired this to be a film and kind of how did you then proceed to get to know Autumn and turn it into, make it, turn it into reality? Well, originally I was going, uh, my partner and I, Brian Porter on Six Nations, we have a charity called the Dreamcatcher Charitable Foundation, which is an indigenous char charity for indigenous people. And one of the things that we were doing was we were working with Sawyer Water and going into communities, I first flew down to Fiji and went into a, some villages where they had no clean water. And I, I helped out with actor Adam Beach. And I realized that I asked them, why am I halfway around the world doing this when we could be doing this back home? And at Sawyer Water were like, what are you talking about? And uh, they realized that nobody really realized that there was this water issues in North America, first world nation. You know? And once they figured that out, we took it upon ourselves with Sawyer Water to go into these indigenous communities and start putting water filtration systems in ourselves paying for it ourselves, just doing the work. And while I was in a, a place called Yamagusasaga, I think, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. It's, a, it's like a full scrabble word about that long, um, but it was really cool in North uh, Ontario. I was told a story about Autumn Pelter. And I said, I gotta meet this girl. And because I really am in a mission you know, I made a film called Rumble, which was a film about showing indigenous people that there were really amazing role models in, in this day and age, and not just from 150 years ago that they could look up to and be inspired by. And Autumn to me was like, well, this is right up my alley. She's an incredible role model. She's doing the work, not just talking about it. You know, a lot of people stand around and talk on social media and put their fist in the air, but they don't do anything. And Autumn and her mom and her family are just, they were getting it done and I had to meet her. So we met in Toronto. And I, once I met her, I said, I need to make a film about her. I need everyone to be knowing this young lady and, and, and she will inspire young people in return. And, and, and so that's, what, that's how it happened. Yeah, wow. Well, and it takes a while to build those relationships and, and kind take of build that trust. It <laughs> didn't take us long. We met, we were best pals right away. <laughs> and then uh, so it worked out good. I met her mom and her sister. We all went to dinner. It was really, really fun. And, and uh, you know, it's just about trust. And, and I think that uh, they knew that we were, we, had, we were out to do something special. And, yeah. and I, she was special. So it was really easy for us. All we had to do was turn the cameras on because she just does the most amazing work. Yeah, really, really does. Which kind of leads me to, we have a few questions in the chat from classrooms and then I'm going to unmute another classroom to ask a question, but we have a question from Katie Umbrieco's class that says, how does it feel, how does it make you feel that your voice is getting heart at such a young age? This one's to you, Lada. Um, well, it's a, it's a lot to process and it's something I, I still feel like I haven't processed yet. Like, even though I've been doing this for quite some time now, it still doesn't feel at some at some at some points it doesn't feel real because of like how big some of the platforms i get to speak on are like i've i've spoken at the united nations a few times and i've spoken also at the world economic forum and at, at when it comes to times like that it does not feel real because it's like i've come so far and i had no idea i was going to even come this far like when i first said my first speech and i was 10 9 years old 8 years old in my own school like I had no idea like just talking about what I felt in that moment was going to bring me to where I am today and I guess it's 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 like an unreal feeling yeah I'm sure it never gets old the there's another question in this in the chat from Spring Creek School um, Mrs. Nickirk's class is asking 
is Autumn still advocating for water rights? So what are you doing now and kind of where, where have you come since the film? Um, well, yeah, I'm still advocating for water rights and I mainly focus on like uh, First Nations communities in Canada. And um, like right now, actually in, in a couple hours, I'm actually leaving to Europe to speak on a larger platform about um, water and my, water activism. Am I allowed to say where or why, but um, yeah, I'm going to Europe and that's, um, I'm still activate. What's the word? Advocating there, <laughs> advocating using my voice. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. And really inspiring for our students here in Montana. We have um, some questions from Magdalene Marmon's class. Magdalene, if you want to unmute yourself and have your students come up to the class and ask if your uh, if microphone works, we'd love to hear from you guys. Well, go ahead. And feel free to introduce yourself, students, and say who you are and your question. There you go. Maybe So she put it in the chat. And the question is, is Autumn planning to be in any other shows like this? So I think the question is related to documentaries. Are you planning to pursue any other projects to highlight your work in um, the future? Definitely if the opportunities do come, yes. But uh, so far there are no other opportunities, but if they do come, then for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Um, and then, a question from St. Library. And students, as we're kind of talking about this, think about what kind of water sources are in your communities. So these are communities from across the state and there's all sorts of different water sources or rivers or lakes. And um, so kind of as you're thinking, feel free to write down and jot down what is closest to your community. We have a question from St. Library fourth grade class, which is what can we do to keep our water clean here on our reservation? And if you're not familiar with Montana, Autumn, maybe you can ask that of like, what, as a water rights commissioner, what is kind of entailed in your work to push forward advocacy for clean water? Well, uh, what I do as a chief water commissioner is I have a seat at the table at a, on a political level with like um, higher leadership in kind of like change makers, people who do make change and are capable of making change. And I have the ability to have a say in decisions that are made for uh, First Nations communities or the Great Lakes or anything surrounding like the Great Lakes and anything that really has to do with water. And advocating is my biggest um, responsibility and using my voice. And that's kind of what I do as Chief Water Commissioner. But um, what you can do to keep your water clean on your reservation, well, I don't necessarily have an answer for that, but um, advocating and like using your voice is like one way to like advocate for change or push for change and I guess that's really my answer for it. Yeah that's awesome and these are tough questions they're big there's complicated answers to them and um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that you're learning a lot more as you go along and I'm curious and then I've got another question but I'm curious like what is the most surprising thing that you've learned over this last few years that is just either shocked you or is like a fun challenge for you? Um, I guess the most surprising thing that I've learned is that these are not easy issues to solve. And that was, I guess, the, the biggest surprise for me. Um, it wasn't just as simple as being like, hey, we need this issue fixed. I've been doing this for almost eight years now and the issue is not fixed. And I guess that was the biggest surprise for me and kind of learning how, how much it feels like the government and people don't care about indigenous issues was also probably another big surprise for me. Yeah, I'm sure that's, that's a lot. And we actually have a question from Spring Creek School, Miss Nickirk's class. They're located on the Tongue River Reservoir here in Montana. And their question is, what can we do here in Montana to support your mission and the work you do, Autumn? Uh, well, um, something you could do to support um, is advocating and using social media social media platforms. That's what I usually like to say is the best thing you can do. Um, using your voices, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, I, I I believe that anybody can do this work, and it's as simple as just using your voice or writing a letter. Because um, 
I've written letter letters to like my local members of parliament in Canada. I've written a letter to the prime minister of Canada and I've even written a letter to the queen um, of England and I've gotten responses from all of them. And that's kind of what I do to try my best to push for change other than just advocating and using my social media platforms. But um, I guess that's um, kind of like my suggestions. Yeah, those are great suggestions and starting points. Any students, um, feel free to unmute yourself if you have any other questions. So I have a question for Stevie too, because you help co-write and co-produce this film. I'm curious about your decision to include Graham Greene and the narration in the and the film is very focused around storytelling and telling a certain history, um, which makes it such a compelling film. And can you, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why his narration is so important to the structuring of this film and Autumn's journey in it and how you decided to weave those two together. You know, there's, there's two reasons uh, for Graham Greene. The real reason that I did the film and I realized that you know, there's an old saying, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to, to hear it, does it actually make noise? And I, I knew that Autumn was, was out there working hard. But what I also come to, came to realize is that most people in the mainstream world have no idea that this problem even exists. So for me, the first thing I needed to do was spread awareness. Um, if I could spread awareness, then more people would hear what Autumn had to say and more people would then learn about the, the issues. And so I couldn't just speak about the issues necessarily. I really needed to find a way to spread awareness. I wanted more people to see the film. So in order to get more people to see the film, Graham Greene is a dear friend of mine. We work together. Graham, would, Graham already wanted to go into the bush with us when we were doing filtration systems on some of these reservations. And I told him about Autumn and he was just like, I gotta do this film. He was so inspired by Autumn. And Graham Greene is probably the, the most successful living Native American actor in history, you know? And um, so Graham agreed to do the narration. And, and by Graham doing the narration, you know, we instantly were at TIFF, we were in all these places because he is a big star. He brought more awareness to Autumn, which therefore makes Autumn's story reach more people. So that's why Graham Greene was so important. Um, we needed to we needed to create awareness so Autumn could get her word out more and more, and that's how we did it. Mm -hmm. And it's so intergenerational too. I mean, it, it kind of speaks to her as a young leader and him having a little more age and wisdom to his storytelling, and it comes together really, really beautifully in the film. Um, you know, just as you said, he represents an elder speaking he represents it sounds like history talking when he speaks in that film i watch people uh literally start crying when they watch this film and they're just so moved and, you know christy belcourt's art and autumn and, and graham that combination is just so powerful mm -hmm. yeah we have a note from spring spring creek school that says the artwork's absolutely mesmerizing on the transition slide so well christy yeah. christy yeah, you know, she she she's a tough one to get. She's a very she's an amazing artist, but she came out and said, "For Autumn, we need to do this," and it was a it was a big deal. It was a really it was an incredible. Everybody came together because everybody really realizes that what Autumn's doing is so important that we all have to help to help her have a larger voice, and that's what we're all all here to do. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's really beautiful. Well, and I, there's actually a question in the chat. We've been talking a lot about advocacy and how to advocate for something. And especially for some of our younger audiences, I'm wondering, and maybe Autumn, you can talk a little bit about this, or Stevie, um, what you mean when you say advocate for something. What is that? What? How? How would you sum that up for our students out there that maybe haven't necessarily advocated for something, don't necessarily know what that concept means, and how to inspire that? You tell them, Autumn. Um, well, this can mean um, helping spread awareness, and that's really just using your voice and standing up for what you believe in or what you feel needs to be changed, if that's the case. And it's advocating is not something that's hard to do. Anybody can be an advocate. Anybody can be a water protector. You don't have to be someone in a high position or someone super famous to be a water advocate or someone who advocates. You can literally be anybody. It doesn't matter uh, what your age is, how old you are. It, you can do it and 
It's just simply standing up for what you believe in. Yeah, and that's what you're doing. And it's incredibly inspiring and great for our young people to be hearing from young leader to young leaders out there. So the question is, have you ever read any books about water and how to protect it? And would you mind sharing a few with us? I'll give this one to, uh, to Autumn and then Stevie, if you want to share any. Um, well, one book that I do recommend is actually written about my Auntie Josephine Mendelman, who was the one who actually like inspired me and uh, like, is like my motivation to why I do what I do. And uh, it's called, the book is called The Water Walker and it's it's a book that's made for children. And it's it just simply, it's kind of like simplifies her, um, like her work and like why it's done. And it talks about the importance of water. And there's like other books that have like, um, that kind of like talk about indigenous issues and kind of have my story in it as well. And one of them is actually um, this book. I don't know if you can see it. It's called We Have a Dream. By, um, where does it say? Written by Dr. Maya Rose Craig. And then this one talks about like missing a murdered indigenous woman, which is like another like big issue that I speak about. And it's written by, it's called If I Go Missing. Which goes. <laughs> written by Brianna Johnny and then like there's just there's several books that, that, that talk about indigenous issues and stuff like that and those are just like some that I recommend those are really great suggestions and a really great question and we have another one from Jennifer and then actually I know Mike has a few book suggestions um but I'm going to ask Autumn another one because Autumn I know you're really busy and you have to go and we really appreciate you taking the time but we have a question from Jennifer Saddam, that is, Autumn, what does it feel like having the responsibility of being such an incredible role model for young Indigenous people around the world? Um, it's definitely a big responsibility to be holding and, ha and to have. Um, but my favorite part about it is uh, the amount of like young people that I have following my journey and that are inspired by the work I do. And I, I just like to add that like doing the work that I do is not easy. Um, there's a lot of negativity and uh, just negative negativity, negative people that do come with this. And it does get very hard at times, but that's, that's something that I've actually, I'm probably most grateful for is that type of stuff because it helps me become a stronger person, helps me go harder at the, go harder at the work that I do. And it's, it's kind of, it, it gives me motivation and uh, one of the other things that do keep me going a lot when times do get hard, and I do, like, there is times where I do feel like giving up and stopping all the work that I do because of how hard it can get at times. But what keeps me going is knowing that I'm a role model to young kids and, and little kids and youth, and what type of role model would I be to them if I just let people get to me and I gave up? And so that's just, like, that's something that I like to talk about is, like, like this work is not, or like the stuff that I do is not always like sunshine and rainbows. It does get really hard. And um, that's just something I think I would like to add to that. Yeah, and you, you talk about that a little bit in the film and it's, it's an emotional thing that it's easy to see being in the spotlight can be sunshine and rainbows, but there's a lot of challenges that go along with that, especially as a young person. And there's actually a really great question and I won't put too many more in your camp, which is, do you have friends that help you or peers that support you that make this work easier? Because oftentimes we put people on a pedestal and say, go do the work, but it's the teamwork and the community that makes the change. And I wonder if you could share that a little bit about that. Um, I think my family would probably be my, like the people that help me the most um, or like family, friends and family. Um, like my sister, she's one of my biggest helps when it comes to doing my work. And my mom, of course, is probably the biggest part of the work that I do. And um, yeah, um, it's probably just like friends, well, family, close family that are my biggest support and help me get through this. Yeah, and those people are really important, as you're saying. Um, there's another really good question, which is, have people started to change their ways after watching this film or listening to you? And in what ways have you seen that change happen? Sometimes change can happen a little slower than we want, but I'm curious if you've seen any 
shifts? Um, there's not any like political change that I feel has come from this, but on terms of like inspiring people and like people becoming more aware of my work is probably the most change that I've seen. And that's good change like still to me because before this was an issue that was not really talked about at all. There was there was like little to no media coverage about these issues. And I think that like this documentary and my story being like put together was like a way for this to become a known issue because this is very important. This is not an issue that should not be talked about. Indigenous issues are always just kind of like swept under the carpet, but this kind of, um, that, like this just shows the issue, I guess, in like a visual way. And I think that's really good. And just like the awareness that was created from it and like the people that became aware of this issue from it is probably the most change that I've seen. And that's, that's enough change for me. <laughs> Yeah, it's really, really powerful. We have another question from St. Library's fourth grade class. And they were curious, in the film, you talk to the prime minister and you get very emotional talking to him because this is really important issues that we're talking about. And they're asking, did the prime minister live up to his promise? And what are the updates there? Well, um, I would say no, the prime minister did not live up to his promise, but he is still prime minister at the time, at the moment. So, you know, there, there's still a tiny bit of hope, but I think the most upsetting part of this for me was being promised that he will protect the water. And one of the commitments that he made when he was um, in one of his terms was to resolve all boil water advisories by March of 2021. It's no longer March of 2021. Of course, we're way past that. And there's still like several First Nations communities in Canada that still have no clean, uh, access to clean drinking water. and that's that's honestly really heartbreaking considering like Canada's past with indigenous people and broken promises and it's really heartbreaking considering that some of these like communities were promised clean drinking water and some of them have been on boil water advisories or haven't been able to drink water for over 30 years most some of them over 20 and it's just to be promised that and then it doesn't happen it's just really sad yeah and I'm sure it, it creates barriers with how you trust adults and how you trust politicians with what they are they going to do what they say that they're going to do <laughs> mm -hmm. which as a young person I'm sure you're fighting that all the time and I have another question and Stevie you can take this one or Autumn you can continue to take these these are these have been really great we just have a few more minutes so I'm just going to ask a few more questions and then we'll wrap up here but I had a student question curious in Miss Marmon's class if this film is scripted and or if Autumn speaks on the fly how did you work that? Because it is a documentary. So we are talking about real things here. Um, and sometimes that you can use different techniques to tell that story. And um, maybe Stevie, you can talk a little bit about those decisions and then Autumn, if you want to talk about what that was like being involved in the process. Uh, it's, it's not scripted. We, we needed Autumn to be Autumn, speak from the heart. Uh, it needed to be real. What's scripted is we wrote out all of the bits of poetry that Graham Greene speaks of in the narration. That was scripted. Um, but Autumn is completely speaking about, you know, a part of her life, what's going on, a bit of her history, and she's on a journey going towards going to New York for the United Nations. And it was sort of like what that entails, uh, you know, what she get packed, the travel shows up. It's, it's, it's not as easy, like she said, it's not easy. And, you know, the government has not kept their promises, but by creating more awareness, it creates pressure for them to have to cre keep those promises. Um, you know, we have to build a, a voice. That's why the youth is so important. You know, a lot of us older people are like, we're worried about our, you know, can we do this? Do we have a job? Can we feed our kids? Well, the young people need to worry about, well, I have water to drink when I grow up. Well, my kids have water to drink. And so that's why Autumn needs to, is there to lead young people because only the young people I think can mobilize and really help make change. And all we're trying to do at Seeing Red Six Nations is help spread awareness for Autumn's message so she can inspire uh, a gigantic army of young people to, do the, to help her do great things. Yeah. Autumn, how was that experience in the film kind of working with Stevie to get that message across? Was there a lot of pressure having the camera on you and having to tell your story and be in the spotlight? Um, no, not necessarily because um, just like, it just felt like 
it was easy. It, I didn't feel any pressure because I was just simply sharing my story and it's something they wanted to hear. And I was speaking from my heart. So like, I don't necessarily feel pressure when I'm just kind of like talking about what I feel. Um, mm-hmm. I, I liked the way that it was set up, like how I was able to like say what I what I felt and like speak from my heart and I have to speak from my script. I liked that a lot. And um, it just I'm 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 quite used to like these types of things, um, cameras. Um, telling my story I'm very used to it but at this point considering how long I've been doing it but yeah it was a pretty fun experience yeah well it's yeah. a beautiful we, film and oh, we, yeah, have go ahead, give, Stevie. we have to give credit to director James Burns too from Vice in New York and he uh he really has a special way and he had a real good connection with Autumn and family and, and I don't want to take all the credit for that because James really really our director was just so great but I'm curious what students how their idea of this term water walker shifted after watching the film. And if students want to share that in the chat, I'd love to hear, or you can unmute yourself and share that with us here right now. But I'm, I'd love to end on Mike. I know you've been quite quiet and patient over there. Can you share a few Montana examples and, and share maybe the Essential Understandings 3 and where this film kind of connects into local, local issues and local things happening here in our state with our tribal groups? Uh, sure. Mohammed uh, Tapiapi. Uh, hello, my relatives. Uh, it's really cool to be a part of this conversation today. And I just want to thank you, Autumn, for being such a great role model for, you know, not only students, but everybody and being an advocate. Stevie, thanks for your work and spreading the word and the message. And, you know, this kind of programming fits perfectly with Indian education for all here in Montana. And so I want to thank all of you students out there for uh, being open with your hearts and minds to listening to indigenous perspectives. But we have our essential understandings regarding Montana Indians, and one of them is all about culture. And, and I'll give you an example from mine. In Dakota culture, we have a saying, it's mitakoyasi. Mitakoyasi means everything is re- related. We are all connected. And I think from an indigenous perspective and thinking about water, we think of it as our relative. It has its own spirit that it's deeply connected to everything. And so I think that's a unique perspective that indigenous people can bring to this conversation is the land is our environment, it's our relative and how can we be a good relative and uh, you know, to water. And you know, something you said, Autumn, was that someday you're gonna be an ancestor and uh, how will your you know, future generations look towards us and I think that's that's a big key. And like what you're saying, Stevie, it's like it's all you young folks out there um, really, you know, coming up, I think are going to, you know, save the planet. Um, we need you. And so um, I think that's all part of it. You know, it doesn't have to be just be Native people working on this issue. It's it's everybody. It's just an issue for humanity. And that's where that mitakoyasi, that how we're all related, we're all connected. And, you know, coming from that aspect, I think is powerful. So thank you for helping to share that message. But that's just, you know what, what I wanted to share is that just unique indigenous perspective about relationships with the water. So, so thanks. Yeah. Awesome. You know, I want to just add to that, that you were right. It is an indigenous issue. It's a global issue. And all of us together as human beings need to tackle this and, and focus on this. And uh, you were dead on Mike about that. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Mike. That's really important. And it's important for all of us here to hear and be reminded of, of this such a short film with such a powerful message. And there's a lot that goes into it and a lot of work that, that comes out of it. Um, so Autumn did have to leave a little early, but we are so appreciative of her taking the time. And I just wanna thank all the classrooms that were able to join us today. If you are not able to have your questions answered, feel free to email me. I'll put my email in the chat and we can get those questions off to Stevie and Autumn and I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them and I'll get those back to you. This has been a really, really special opportunity today and we're really excited to kick this off and for all of you to join us from across the state. We hope you got all those questions answered. If everybody wants to give a big wave as a thank you, to Stevie and Mike for joining us today. It's been really such an honor and really special for us to share this story with our students here in the state. So thank you so much. And we hope to see you. We have another film club next month, mid-November, our film Fruits of Labor, which follows a young 
Mexican indigenous girl doing community work for her, her community in Sitsay. So feel free to look at our website and check out the film club and register for that. And we'll give you all the tools that we gave you for this one. So thank you guys so much for joining and we hope to see you next time. Bye everyone, thank you.